So on behalf of CGSR's Nuclear Crossroads Speaker Series, it's my great pleasure to welcome back Professor Jason Castillo to Lawrence Livermore. Dr. Castillo is an associate professor at Texas A&M at the George W. H. Bush School of Government and Public Service. Over the last decade, Jason has authored a series of widely disseminated and read articles on military strategy, nuclear deterrence, and WMD terrorism. He also championed actual policy solutions to these issues, working at the Department of Defense's Policy Planning Office, the RAND Corporation, and the Institute for Defense Analyses. Finally, many of you are already familiar with Jason from the National Security Leadership Program that Livermore runs in collaboration with Texas A&M. As one recent <laughs> Livermore graduate of this program remarked to me, Jason was the best instructor I've ever had, period. As a living bridge between the academy, US government, and the national lab, Jason brings a unique set of experiences to the current renaissance in research on strategic nuclear policy. And his seminar this morning on how potential adversaries might use nuclear weapons in a conflict addresses an important and timely issue for US national security. Jason's going to speak for about 45 minutes. And following our standard format, I'm going to moderate a Q&A session afterwards. And with that, let me welcome Jason to the stage. So uh, I always like coming to Livermore because of it's beautiful. Uh, you can talk about nuclear war, and you can have a delicious glass of over-oaked Chardonnay. So it's my, it's my kind of place. Uh, if you can survive the Hertz rental car counter at SFO, which I did not last night. Uh, I just finished a book on military effectiveness. And uh, I started down the road on military effectiveness because I was told in graduate school that uh, writing about nuclear weapons is passe, and you need to find a different topic, or otherwise you're not going to get a job. And uh, now that I have tenure, I can write about passe topics. Uh, but I think this is uh, one of those topics that actually is uh, attracting a lot of attention, especially in the circles you, you people play in, uh, in the government circles, and people thinking seriously about national security problems. You don't have terrorism on the brain. You're thinking about other issues. And so this is my attempt to try to understand where we're going uh, in terms of nuclear deterrence after MAD. Right? What, is, what, is it, what, what does nuclear deterrence look like when it's not in the bipolar context? And in particular, uh, this is a, so I'm starting a second book project, and I'm going to pick your brains. I'm going to put my ideas out there and hopefully get some good feedback about how to frame these arguments. But one particular uh, issue that interests me is how we should deal with nuclear-armed adversaries. Right? So if you, you're all familiar with the nuclear uh, weapons debate, right? There's non-proliferation, and then when that didn't work, we tried counter-proliferation, and when that ends up being a giant military occupation that we still can't tell if we won or not, uh, we're probably in the realm of managing proliferation. One of the things we have to manage is our relationship with states that have nuclear weapons, and we have to try to understand not only why they acquired nuclear weapons in the first place, but how they might interact with uh, our security policy, and, 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 and in particular, if we have to uh, get into a conflict with them. So the central question here I want to ask is, what strategies could regional nuclear powers adopt to deter, what nuclear strategies could they adopt to deter US conventional forces or conventional forces of others? And if deterrence fails, defeat those conventional forces. And I'm starting from the radical assumption, which is radical in, in my field of political science, that uh, states want nuclear weapons because they're afraid of conventional weapons. They've seen what happened to Saddam twice. If they took a Ouija board and asked Saddam, would, do you wish now that you had nuclear weapons? He probably would say, yes, nuclear weapons are a good thing. There's a reason the US invaded Iraq and not North Korea. So let's take the next step and say, well, what's, what could these regional powers actually do with their nuclear weapons, their posture, their use policy to deter or defeat a conventional attack. Now, the, this question is important for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is we want to know about the command and control policies of these regional nuclear powers, both day to day when the forces are generated. We want to understand what escalation pathways look like. Uh, 
and we want to understand what those elusive off-ramps are that people talk about in government, right? When I think of off-ramps, and when I go to these talks and people talk about, we need an off-ramp for PACOM if China uses nuclear weapons, I think of those large, uncompleted freeway arms that we have in the Houston area that go off into nowhere, right? Like, off-ramp to what? What does that look like? Um, relatedly, we want to understand what war termination looks like. We thought about these issues, by the way, with the Soviets, but how do we think about them with the Chinese or North Koreans or, or how, how do India and Pakistan think about war, term, war termination? And, and finally, there's the uh, very important issue of can we project power into different regions if our potential competitors have nuclear weapons, right? So we can frame this in the larger debate about anti-access area denial capabilities. These, I would put these probably at the top of those kind of capabilities. Having nuclear weapons uh, is going to, uh, if our adversaries have nuclear weapons and you want to project power into a region, you're going to have to think about the configuration of your forces and how they're going to operate. So, and the last point here is, interestingly enough, we face the Cold War problem in reverse, right? Remember, during the Cold War, we were conventionally weak, and we thought about using nuclear weapons first against the Soviet Union, right? And today, our adversaries play the role of NATO and the United States. And, and we're interestingly in the role of, of the Soviet Union with conventional superiority. So it's the Cold War problem in reverse. Uh, there's a lot of existing work out there. Some of it you've seen come through Livermore, right? Uh, people like Vipin Narang are talking about how uh, states posture their nuclear forces. You have uh, people like uh, Peter Fever, who used to work on the National Security Council, and, and Jordan Sang, <laughs> arguing about command and control arrangements in these states and how they can be dangerous or or less dangerous. You have uh, arguments about how when states acquire nuclear weapons, they go on rampages, but the historical record actually shows they, there's a lot of bluster, but they don't actually conquer lots of territory. And finally, you have people like Daryl Press and Kier Lee were talking about the kinds of capabilities we would need to engage with these states. Uh, and they're building on the work of others, like Dean Wilkening and at Rand and uh, Dave Achmanek, who I think is the DASB for resources and transformation in, in OSD. So, this is a problem people are starting to grapple with. And, and what I want to know is, if there's a conflict, how do these regional nuclear powers behave? So three arguments. One is I'm going to present a framework for how to think about this problem. And by a framework, I'm, it's just a way to do analysis. And I'm going to be clear about my assumptions so that you can take it and you can vary them and change them and maybe get different outputs. But this is a first cut at the problem. How will they behave, right? And by regional nuclear powers, I mean those nuclear armed powers who are outside the US nuclear umbrella, either tacitly or explicitly. So I'm not talking about Israel. I'm not talking about Britain or France. I'm talking about a whole other host of countries. The argument I make is they're going to deter conventional attacks with de deliberate forms of escalation. And I'm going to outline what I think those forms of escalation are and how they work. And the bad news part of this story, I think there really is no good news here, is that they're going to try to manipulate the risk of uncontrollable escalation. It's going to be very hard for a variety of reasons to control escalation once nuclear weapons start to get used in these conflicts. Here the, here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about what these regional nuclear powers look like, the strategies. The third part is what probably interests you most. What does this mean for power projection? And then review these findings. Let's talk about these regional nuclear powers. Who are they? Uh, if you're outside the U.S. nuclear umbrella with nuclear weapons, you're Russia, China, Pakistan, India, North Korea, and, and possibly a future Iran. And I say that because uh, I know there's this complex debate that I can't really follow about Iran's nuclear program and when they're going to break out and is it latent. And I think as a pr prudent planner, we just need to think about when Iran has nuclear weapons, right? As a worst case assumption, what does it mean for our ability to extend endurance and project power? All these countries that I describe as regional nuclear powers, they worry about conventional conflicts. There are different dyads that trouble them. China, for instance, worries about the United States. Russia worries about China and the United States. North Korea worries about us. You notice there's a common theme here. We're involved in a lot of these conflicts. Uh, and, and, and in most of these cases where the US is involved, the stakes are going to favor the regional nuclear power. That is, we're going to be fighting for things they care about more than we do. And I know that's shocking, because once I give this talk, and there are some people from CSIS in the back of the room, and I, I said, uh, I think China cares more about Taiwan than we do. And they, they were shocked, right? You know, how could, how could uh, China care more about Taiwan, right? And Taiwan's our venerable ally that we have an ambiguous commitment with, and we have 
two core of US forces and thousands of tactical nuclear weapons there? How could there be any uh, disagreement that Taiwan, so you kind of scratch your head when people talk in those terms. It's, it, I think it's pretty clear the Chinese see Taiwan as part of their homeland, and, and so uh, they're gonna view a conflict over Taiwan as having greater stakes, not only for historical reasons, but probably for domestic reasons. But again, I would invite the comments of people who are experts on China. I'm just a, I, I'm a, I'm a person who draws a black box around a country and looks at a few strategic principles and then tries to extract from there. Uh, and lastly, what are these conflicts gonna look like? I think what these conflicts in the future, the, the character that, will, that they will take on is uh, the variety of limited attacks, limited forms of aggression. And, 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 and happily, uh, Brother Putin has illustrated this for us recently in Ukraine, right? It, what Putin is doing in Ukraine reminds me a lot of Tom Schelling taking his daughter to the beach in Arms and Influence, right? You know the story where he describes salami tactics and he says, don't go into the water, right? And then she sticks her toe in the water. I mean, Putin is doing the same thing, right? He's slicing the salami of NATO commitments. Now, arguably, the commitment that we've made to Ukraine, Ukraine is very ambiguous, right? But what happens when he starts doing that to the Baltic countries, where we actually have drawn a line and probably haven't configured our forces in the right way to deal with those salami tactics? So what we're dealing with are, are these regional nuclear powers making limited land grabs or limited forms of aggression, maybe sponsoring terrorism in the way that Pakistan does against India, taking small forms of aggression, right? Perhaps feeling, feeling emboldened by their nuclear forces. And the question then becomes, how do we as the United States deal with them, right? And, and you know, uh, it's pretty typical in these war games when you know, country X does support some form of terrorism, against our client Y, and how should we react? Well, you know, the Air Force has a plan, it's called Blue Thunder. We're gonna take down the air defense, right? And then the, uh, the regional nuclear power detonates a weapon, and oh, well, it's time for lunch. Uh, <laughs> let's address this issue in further research, right? It's become kind of a broken record. So let's, let's think about that further research now. Uh, I develop a typology of regional nuclear powers. You might have a different typology, but I just wanted a way to classify them. Uh, and I'm open to any, uh, you know, these distinctions I don't think are radical, but you, know, you have new nuclear powers, they have a handful of weapons, they're not particularly precise, North Korea, uh, and then they proceed to a next level of a minor nuclear power from 50 to several hundred nuclear weapons and increasingly concerned about precision. Uh, and then you have Russia, which I think stands apart from the other regional nuclear powers. It's, it's not quite our peer, but uh, it's the closest country out there that we call our nuclear peer, and they do have precision delivery capabilities. All right, so let's get to the meat of it. Here, uh, the, the, the first key argument here is that uh, these regional nuclear powers will pursue, pursue assured retaliation as their way to deter nuclear attacks. Now, the focus of this talk is about conventional attacks, but the key to deterring a conventional attack is having some retaliatory capability in reserve. Right? And it doesn't have to be assured destruction like the United States. There is no need for the McNamara and Dover curve here for these regional nuclear powers. They just have to have a handful of weapons that can target things that we value, and they may not even be the continental of the United States. There could be countries in the region. Right? They can be countries we're defending in the region. And the threat here they're making is, uh, is the game worth the candle? Right? What is at stake? for the United States that they would want to take a tumble with these regional nuclear powers and risk one landing on the United States or one getting in the hands of terrorists or one landing on, on Seoul or some other city. How do they maintain the survival forces? I'm a big believer in, in mobile missiles, in TELs. Uh, I see them as land submarines. I know that I, there, I have colleagues in the academy and, and I know that you're out there in the government world too think that uh, we have the capabilities of the Eye of Sauron, and we can find all these mobile missiles. I'm, I'm not as sanguine about that, and, and primarily, it's, 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 for me, it's not a technical issue. It's just I don't want to get into the business of trying to find these things. I find it very, very difficult, and, and I think that's the kind of threat that our adversary has to make. Uh, but there are some limits to these survivable forces. Because they vary in size, you can imagine the clever briefer explaining to a decision maker in a crisis that, you know, they're gonna use these weapons and at some point we may wanna limit the amount of damage they can do to us, so if we can disrupt the command and control and maybe take out some of the facilities we know. So there are temptations here because 
these regional nuclear powers, with the exception of Russia, are re really junior varsity kind of competitors. And so you can imagine the temptation of being to try to limit damage. All right, what about deterring conventional attacks? So uh, if we arrayed the kind of threats that these states face from conventional to nuclear, we could, we could come up with some kind of list. Your list might be different. But then the question becomes, at what point, as a regional nuclear power, when you're in a conventional conflict, do you use nuclear weapons, right? And that begs a bigger question, which is, is it credible to use nuclear weapons in a conventional conflict, right? And, and what's the threshold for doing that? And this is a familiar problem for us, because we had to face the problem in the extended deterrence context. You remember the old, will you trade a college station for Frankfurt, right? Uh, will you, knowing that the Soviets can retaliate with nuclear weapons, why would you use nuclear weapons first? And these states face a similar problem. Is it, how, do I, how do I generate a credible threat to make you think that I will actually use nuclear weapons in, in my own defense in a conventional conflict? So what I do here is I say, okay, I'm not an expert in all these countries. I don't, I don't read their languages. I don't have access to all their classified data. So let's, let's strip away and start simply and say, with these assumptions, what kinds of strategies to, to deter conventional attack would you adopt, right? So uh, first, it's, and this is not a realistic assumption. These are unitary political military leaderships. Even in the China case, right, we, we have these discussions about whether or not the Chinese military takes orders from the Chinese political leadership. But just to simplify the problem, let's assume that they have unitary leadership, that they want to survive, another radical assumption, that they're strategic, and of course, right, you, know, you know that there are arguments out there that say country X is, is not like us because they haven't had the enlightenment and so they're probably not strategic thinkers and they, once they get nuclear weapons they have this death wish to, to bring about a religious apocalypse. But just for the purpose of starting the conversation, let's assume that they weigh costs and benefits and that they're uncertain about the intentions of their adversaries and particularly our intentions and how we might behave in a conflict. So this is a first cut at this problem. And what I do is I argue that there are two key variables, because as a social scientist, variables are very important to us. There are two key variables that will drive the choice of strategy. One is where you sit on that categorization of capabilities, whether you're a minor uh, or a major nuclear power. And the second, more importantly, is what are your conventional capabilities? All these regional nuclear powers are weaker conventionally than we are in kind of aggregate terms. But the real question here is, do they have conventional options so they don't have to escalate immediately? Do they have options? Are there sets of military missions where they actually might perform OK and don't have to reach for nuclear weapons first? So capabilities, where you are on that list, determines how ambitious you can be. And the threats motivate you for deciding whether or not you want to choose an ambitious strategy. So if you don't have many conventional options, you're going to try to find nuclear strategies that are pretty ambitious, ambitious. So how do you choose a strategy? So this is the familiar um, ladder of escalation, at least with my PowerPoint skills. And here, what you're doing here is attenuating the problem between doing nothing and a massive countervalue first strike. How do I, how do I attenuate the problem and find different options, right? And, and what strategies are there in between? How do I make them credible? And, and there are schools of thought that we haven't adjudicated. We, we don't really know if uh, extended nuclear deterrence worked in the Cold War. Uh, I was at a conference two weeks ago on cross-domain deterrence, right? And we, before I even could cross a domain, I wanted to know from different people in the room, how did we deter, right? Maybe the Soviets never wanted to invade, invade West Germany. But assuming they did want to invade West Germany, then how did deterrence work, right? And if you're in the academy, you have one set of ideas. If you're in Nebraska, you have another set of ideas. And if you're at the RAND Corporation, you even have a third set of ideas. So there's no agreement on this fundamental issue. We've run the Cold War. We, we decided we won, right? History ended. And, but we still don't know what made deterrence work. So there are three schools of thought that these regional adversaries can choose from. The first is what I would call the punishment school. It says that nuclear weapons are not giant artillery shells. They're about imposing costs, right? They're about hurting you uh, in different ways, typically industry or population centers. Uh, my old uh, mentor, Roger Molanders, some of you might have known him, he used to work at RAND, but before then he was on the National Security Council. 
and worked uh, with Zbigniew Brzezinski and, and Wild Bill Odom on PD-59. And they were talking about nuclear strategy. And he mem remembers talking to some of these Carter people about you know, counterforce and second strike prompt counterforce and these politicians, right, these staffers who don't live in this world. Their eyes kind of glaze over and they're horrified. And, and, and one of them says, uh, I think it was Hamilton Jordan, I think one nuclear weapon detonated over Washington <laughs> during working hours would probably be enough to deter, right? That is the distillation of the punishment school. And up here you see one of their big proponents, and that's Tom Schelling, right? These are the arguments, and Schelling's famous for his book, for many of his books, but the core argument here is from arms and influence. When he talks about that not only are nuclear weapons about hurting people, but they're about manipulating the risk that things will get out of control. What I've always thought was interesting about Schelling is he's an economist, right? An economist believe in homo economicus, we're all very hyper-rational, and we, we do the right thing, and if we don't do the right thing, it's because we had imperfect information. When you dig deep into Schelling's book, the theory of war, how war happens, right? How you get uncontrollable escalation is fear, accidents, uh, emotions, anger, right? kind of irrational things. And, and Schelling is saying that you don't want to cross the line and get into a conflict because things will get out of control. And as a consequence, states should do things to make sure that they get out of control. Right? You know, there's a, a, a famous book, well, maybe not famous, maybe it's famous for me because I have two hard copies, but uh, Barry Posen's book, Inadvertent Escalation. And in the book, Posen talks about at the end of the Cold War how we would fight air land battle or FOFA, would interact in a negative way with Soviet capabilities and would cause inadvertent escalation, right? Well, people like Schelling and Jervis and nuclear Brody, nuclear revolution types, people in the punishment school would say, that's good. I want, I want the system to be primed for inadvertent escalation because I don't want anyone to cross that line. That's the logic of the punishment school. And that's where most of us in the academy are, right? I was trained by, a, I'm a grandson of Schelling because I was trained by Charles Glazer. And I remember once seeing Glazer go after Don Rumsfeld in 1998 over uh, this sort of missile defense issue. And, and Rumsfeld just dismissed him, right? And said, uh, you know, punishment, nuclear revolution, that's great when you're in your ivory tower, but I'm in the real world. And in the real world, we need real options, right? So we're not going to rely on this kind of stuff. So, the second school, uh, Harold Brown, another figure probably familiar to this group, uh, this is the denial school, school right? And it's, it's uh, epitomized by the countervailing strategy that came out of, I think I mentioned it earlier, PD-59 in the 1970s. And the idea here was we need to be able to deny Soviet victory along all dimensions, all rungs of the escalation ladder, right? So nuclear weapons are not necessarily about punishment. They're about stymieing the aggressor. Right? And how we should look at this is in terms of escalation dominance. Right? If you do something at a certain level of violence, then I need to be, demonstrate that you can't go any higher without losing or suffering costs. Right? And how do you make credible threats? Well, if the punishment school is about generating mechanisms and convincing you things were going to get out of control, the denial school is about controlling escalation. So in other words, it, it sort of has this Marquise, the Queensberry rules, right? We're gonna, we're there gen this is how gentlemen fight nuclear wars, and we're gonna do this in a very gradual, pristine way. But to be able to do that, the essential element is controlling nuclear escalation. And this, for that reason, it's a more ambitious set of arguments about deterrence than the punishment school. All right, this is your favorite school though, right? This is the damage limitation school which I thought about calling it the, dis the dis disarmament school, but I thought people's heads would explode, right? Disarmament, right? That's how we think about disarmament in DOD. Damage limitation, right? These, these guys, uh, I assigned this article in class called Victory is Possible by Colin Gray and, uh, oh, what's the other guy? He works, Colin Gray, he used to be in the, uh, I'm blanking on the name. Anyway, Colin Gray's argument is that you know, if you read Clausewitz, uh, you, you see that the way to deal with this nuclear problem is disarmament, right? You have to go after the guy's nuclear forces. And, and this was the kind of Curtis LeMay view of, of nuclear deterrence. This is, this is uh, 
when I teach students about nuclear strategy for the first time, I say, our policy was not MAD. Right? First of all, MAD is not a strategy. MAD is a condition. It's, a, it's something that you, that you face. It's a constraint. Right? And we never accepted that constraint. We've always thought about if deterrence fails, we're going to try to limit damage. Right? We're going to do it for moral reasons and strategic reasons. Right? And if it was really hard in the Cold War, we still tried. But the good news, it's less hard today. Right? And so that makes this kind of strategy very attractive. Right? And the goal here is to destroy and disrupt your adversary's nuclear forces. And the key to credible threats is having counterforce superiority. And, and, and the good news about today that's different than the Cold War is that you can have conventional counterforce. I don't necessarily have to disarm you with nuclear weapons, right? which is better for the environment. Right? So <laughs> I can still save the bay and, and do counterforce. And, uh, we have missile defenses, which can mop up ragged retaliation. So, but this is also the most ambitious strategy. So three schools of thought, punishment, denial, damage, limitation. Here's the escalation ladder. Uh, here are four strategies. Let me take you through them with examples. China, India, they are minor nuclear powers, right? Uh, they have conventional forces, which means they don't have to reach for nuclear forces first. Uh, if you look at the debates about China's nuclear strategy, it's I think it's best to say it's ambiguous with you know, the panda hugger crowds saying uh, the Chinese will never use nuclear weapons first. And then you know, Bill Gertz in the Washington Times saying the Chinese are coming after us with their great underwall of nuclear forces. In my framework, right, they'll think about limited nuclear options as last resort. Last resort because they have conventional options. And so what do little, limited nuclear options allow you to do? They allow you to inflict punishment, right, demonstrate resolve. This is straight out of the punishment school. You know, turn this war off. Things are about to get out of hand. Okay? And it's last resort. North Korea and a future Iran, less conventionally formidable, less conventionally formidable, so they're going to have to reach for these weapons first, but they're constrained with the number of weapons they have. So they'll use limited nuclear options early in a conflict. This is actually kind of interesting because I think it was two years ago when we had the latest dust up with North Korea. General Short was on WBUR on point, and he was talking about how the way to deal with North Korea if things get out of hand, right, is first we're gonna we're gonna back them down the escalation ladder. And I was like, wow, I see visions of Harold Brown and the countervailing strategy and Herman Kahn. And if that doesn't work, we're gonna disarm them. And and that kind of alarmed me because in, in my view, because of conventional weakness, they're gonna reach for nuclear weapons early first. And and if I were advising North Korea, I would tell dear young leader, whatever, whoever is in charge these days, I would say, make sure Wolf Blitzer is on this, in the Situation Room, and you detonate one nuclear weapon over the Sea of Japan to remind the American people that the game might not be worth the candle. Right? So we have to think about how we would respond in those circumstances. Higher up the ladder is Pakistan. I think Pakistan, and, and here I'm borrowing from Vipin Narang's excellent work on Pakistan. They're developing shorter range nuclear forces. I think that's to deal with uh, cold start or dreams about cold start in India. I think there's a debate about whether or not India can actually do these things. But this is straight out of the NATO playbook, right? How Pakistan talks about using nuclear weapons on the battlefield could look like a RAND report written in the 1970s. And higher up the ladder is, uh, is Russia, pursuing what I think is flexible response. Uh, flexible response is like the Jeopardy category of potpourri. It's a little bit of everything, right? And if you those of you who study Russia nuclear doctrine, it sounds sometimes like it's about limited nuclear options. It has a counter-conventional element. And it also sounds like it has a little bit of a damage limitation counterforce element. So they may not be able to uh, reach the capabilities they had during the Cold War, but they're, gro they're groping in that direction is my argument. Regardless, and this is the key takeaway, because I know in a talk like this, you probably take away 30%. The rest is, like, what am I having for lunch and what's for dinner? But the key takeaway here is that all these elements of the escalation ladder, all these elements of the escalation ladder are fundamentally me mechanisms to generate risk. Even if they don't stymie an attack, even if you don't, can't limit damage as a regional nuclear adversary, you pursue these things because as you go up the ladder, you're telling the United States things can get out of control. There are ways of manipulating risk. 
in a conventional conflict, the regional nuclear adversary is grabbing the hand of the United States and say, join me in a, in a very scary walk. We're going to walk down this bridge together. And at some point, this bridge is going to collapse and things are going to get out of control. So they may make arguments about damage limitation and stopping a conventional attack and demonstrating resolve. But at the end of the day, I think what they're really saying is things can get out of control and we have options. We have mechanisms for demonstrating how this can happen. And I'll give you a piece of evidence from our own situation. Uh, the historian Mark Trachtenberg has done a very interesting paper on Bob Jervis, who is sort of the successor to Bernard Brody on thinking about nuclear deterrence. You find these paper when, uh, papers late at night when you Google second strike counterforce. And <laughs> in the paper, there's, there's uh, quotes from both Harold Brown and James Schlesinger about how they had great doubts about our ability to control escalation. But they knew that when they testified in front of Congress and they would light their pipes, because that's what you did back in the 70s, and sit in front of Congress and talk about our options for nuclear war, they had to put on a, they had to put on a pretty convincing performance. And the goal of the performance was we needed to convince the Soviets that we were just a bit crazy. Right? Just a bit out of touch, and we thought we had thinkable options for nuclear war. And at the end of the day, so you have this, you have this window dressing of countervailing strategy and escalation dominance. But at the core, it's, but maybe it won't work, and things will get out of control. And I think that our regional nuclear adversaries have the same logic. Uh, they, they, may be, they may discover it in different ways. They may articulate it in different parts of the escalation ladder, but the core argument here is that things are going to get out of control because they, <coughs> they want them to get out of control. They want to draw a line, and they want us to understand that if we cross it, we may not be able to control what happens afterwards. All right, what does that mean for a US power projection? It means you should all vote for Rand Paul. Uh, <laughs> so how should we respond? And this is the part where I could use your help because I'm thinking through this. Uh, I think there are four responses. One, one is we can, and again, we're borrowing from those schools, disarming <laughs> attacks, limit damage. And there's a great article that's com just coming out in the Journal of Strategic Studies by Austin Long and Brendan Green on this subject that says that during the Cold War we could have actually limited damage a lot more than we <coughs> thought we could have because of Soviet capabilities and what we now know about Soviet forces. But at the, at, the, at the end of the day, so you can limit damage, you know. How much <laughs> damage can you limit, right? The second thing you can do is escalation dominance. The third is limited conventional war. You know there's a rich literature in the 1950s that talked about fighting limited conventional wars and how to keep them limited. Uh, I have checked out some of those books and they're in my shelf now. You know, people like Osgood and Mort Halperin. And finally, uh, thinking about deterring regional powers to begin with so we don't have to get into <coughs> get into this game. So what about disarming attacks? So this is the kind of conversation where whenever I give this talk, it's like, well, if you were cleared at my level, dot, 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 right? Mm -hmm. But th the simple argument is I am very pessimistic that we can find all these mobile missiles slash land submarines, right? And so what I did is, is starting to think about how the Air Force sees the problem, and they talk about it in terms of a kill chain, right? You gotta find, you gotta fix, you gotta track, you gotta target, then you gotta engage, and then you decide, do we get it? If not, then we have to queue up the system all over again, right? And all along the kill chain, there are these different puzzles, right? First of all, can I find these things if they're concealed? And do I have enough sensors to fix those targets, right? And then can I track them in an environment where I may have contested airspace? Then can I engage them, right? And after I engage them, will I be able to tell whether I hit a conventional tell or a nuclear arm tell? And I think that's a, that's a huge problem that, that, you know, if you're someone from the punishment school, you, you find that very comforting that you, know, you can't disarm someone of their nuclear forces. But if you're a Curtis LeMay type, you think, we gotta work this problem, right? And it's, it would be fair if our adversaries painted their conventional tells blue and then their nuclear tells red so we can d differentiate between them. But even that simple example shows, I, I just, I find it very difficult 
that we could find all these mobile missiles. And remember, if you have the Hamilton-Jordan standard for nuclear deterrence, you think one of these going off somewhere over a place that you care about is probably enough to deter you, right? I mean, this, remember, um, our fears of nuclear terrorism are one small device going off somewhere we care about, right? So why would we not be deterred in the same situation. I, I don't understand the disconnect. Fundamentally, are the states worth the risk, right? What are we fighting about that we want to get into this game of finding the mobile missiles before they attack us, or attack our allies, or get used, or lost, or stolen by terrorists? What's the game that we would, what's at stake that we want to do that, right? I don't, are we defending West Germany anymore? I don't think so, not yet. I mean, Putin will eventually get there, but not now. So then you come to this sort of escalation dominance, limited conventional war approach. And, and there are a couple things to remember. First is that uh, you're pushing the regional nuclear power into a situation where it has to start thinking about using nuclear weapons first. And to do that, it starts to relax its command and control. Right? So in order to use these weapons first, I have to remove locks and delegate, pre-delegate authority. Right? So you're the system is primed, the structural constraint here is primed for accidents. And if we care about nuclear terrorism, we should not want our regional nuclear adversaries to practice some of these strategies because they're going to do so in a way that relaxes their command and control environment. What we want these regional nuclear powers to do is take their nuclear weapons, don't mate them, put them in a cave somewhere where we can't find them and no one else can, and they never bring them out to play. But if you put them in a situation where they're worried about a conventional conflict, then they're going to mate those weapons, they're going to practice with them, and in a crisis, they're going to relax the command and control so they can ensure that they're used, which also has the unintentional and perhaps intentional, if you're Tom Schilling, consequence of ensuring accidental use or increasing the probability of accidental use. All this means is I think that escalation is likely in this kind of confrontation. I just took you through the first argument about how they have incentives to deliberately escalate. Second is crisis instability, right? Remember, they have an assured retaliatory capability, but still a tempting target. So somewhere in Washington, right, there's probably a clever briefer who will convince a policymaker that we could do damage limitation. And then if you have to think about this from the side of the adversary, they know this conversation is taking place. Again, Schelling described this really well. You know that I know that you know that I know, right? And we get into this reciprocal fear of surprise attack. And, there, and it, bec it becomes less a conversation about what's at stake and more about there's a crisis and someone's going to strike first and it's better to strike first than strike second. So crisis instability, the second argument. Third is inadvertent escalation. I alluded to that earlier, the way we fight, right? Our adversaries understand how we fight. First. Uh, we go to the American Foreign Legion and say, you're really scary. Second, we tear down your air defense. And by tearing down your air defense, right, we start to rip holes in your security architecture. And, and those can be HOV lanes to go after your command and control and your nuclear forces. Right? How can these different adversaries tell the difference between what we say is a conventional attack, what actually might look like a conventional counterforce attack? I mean, we're, very, we're good at precision. We're good at tearing down air defense. We're good at taking out conventional forces. Why not apply that to nuclear forces? And an adversary who has only so many survivable weapons, right, is going to feel that pressure even more. And lastly, uh, accidental escalation, right? If, if you're a believer in the Scott Sagan book about the limits of safety, that works here too, right? And, and probably works even more because you have an organization that's under great stress. So I think the system is primed for lots of escalation. And then this is the game plan, right? This is what they want. If, if, I, if I thought I was going to, I was in the US crosshairs and I'm a regional nuclear power, I would start spinning out think tank stuff about how can't control nuclear war, it's really dangerous, accidents could happen, right? Slip it to the people who are interested in the gray literature, right? So it can find its way into the Washington Times. So my answer about how we should respond is not very, uh, not very attractive. It's not sexy. There's no, there's no iPod app right, or iPhone app that's going to solve this problem. I think we need to focus on uh, extended deterrence. And by that, I mean 
if you start from the premise that escalation is hard to control to begin with, right, because there are many motives and pressures for escalation, then I think we have to avert these conflicts to the start, right? We don't want to go down this game tree. So uh, how about doing things to reduce the chances that local allies or, or, or allies in different parts of the world don't fall victim to these forms of aggression, right? The forms of aggression that worry us most are fait accompli. Right? If the Cold War, we worried about the Pearl Harbor attack out of the blue, I think today we worry about the sort of Saddam Hussein attack on Kuwait. There's going to be some place we care about, they're going to grab it quickly, and we're going to have to reverse that form of aggression. Right? And, and Barry Posen has a great piece in 1995 uh, issue of Security Studies. I think it was entitled, What If Saddam Had Had Nuclear Weapons? And if you wa ever want to see a smart person struggle with how to eject Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait if Saddam had nuclear weapons, go read that article. Right? It's hard. It's hard. So you, to, to avoid this problem, you have to make choices about what parts of the world you care about and which parts of the world you don't care about. And when you're a unipolar power and, and other people can't really oppose you, you, you can be left with ambiguous commitments because there are cheap ways to keep people out of places that you care about. But today, ambiguity might invite forms of aggression, and you might, for domestic political reasons, find yourself having to reverse that form of aggression, and then for all the reasons that I just outlined, I'm not sure we want to tussle with regional nuclear powers. Uh, and then lastly, I think we need some strategies to manage escalation and terminate conflicts. Uh, so my, my, my argument is probably not attracted to this group because I'm saying basically uh, don't get involved in these conflicts and do what you can to prevent your allies becoming low-hanging fruit. But there's another set of arguments that says, well, you, you're going to get into these conflicts. And so what you need to think about is how you terminate these conflicts and what they look like and how you manage escalation. And I'm not sanguine about that because I think there's lots of incentives and pressures for our adversaries out of weakness to make sure that we can't do that. All right, conclusion. Uh, if you take those assumptions that I had at the beginning of the talk, I think it makes the problem worse. Uh, because instead of unitary rational actors, you have states with civil military tensions. They're, they're not interested in survival. They're interested in changing the status quo. Uh, here's my favorite. They get taken over by extremists, ISIS with nuclear weapons. Uh, or they might have a desire, like Pakistan, to extend deterrence to places like Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia feels dangerous, right? So what does this all mean when you relax the assumptions? I don't think it changes the set of strategies. It just means that you're, these states are more primed for aggression. They're going to be more apt to take these limited land grabs. And you're going to be in a position, the US will be in a position of having to reverse those land grabs. So when we relax the assumptions of the model, I think the world looks much more dangerous. So to sum up, uh, regional nuclear powers have lots of incentives to make sure that escalation gets out of control. There's deliberate motives, but also there's pressures just in the strategic context for escalation. Uh, they can choose from three different schools, and they all have different logics about how deterrence works. But I think the one school that really dominates is the punishment school. You can pretend that you have this escalation dominant strategy. You can pretend that you have nuclear weapons to defeat conventional forces. But what they do concurrently, it's not mutually exclusive, they generate risk. The risk that things are going to get out of control. I think the U.S. is going to find it very hard to control escalation in these circumstances. So the best solution is to deter before they start. And uh, the good news is when you relax the framework's assumptions, uh, the problem gets much, much worse. So I wish I had good news, but I don't. Uh, but, but maybe if you're an isolationist, this is good news, right? <laughs> and, and maybe I could consult for Rand Paul. But anyway, uh, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Do you want me to? Do you want to? All right. Oh, I'm, where, where am I supposed to stand? Sorry, right here. All right. Oh, I can move around now. Indeed. <laughs> Free roaming. So we have about 45, minute for, 45 minutes for questions. I'm going to start off with the prerogative of the moderator. Uh -huh. So it would be great if we could deter these conflicts before they start. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have to figure out a way to terminate a conflict, what are the best off ramps? You spoke about off ramps at the beginning. What are specific policies? Should we be offering golden parachutes to the leadership? What are things we can actually do in those situations to avoid having to resort to escalation dominance? 
Yeah, this is the question my wife always asks me at dinner when she's tired of talking about this. Uh, Fantastic. Right, so I haven't thought through this problem uh, as much as I would like, so let me offer you some speculation, dinner table, dinner table speculation. One is the golden parachute I think is too late because the idea is to terminate the conflict before nuclear weapons start to go off. So second, I think we need to start thinking about how to communicate uh, without words, right? I mean, ideally you'd have some kind of red line, but I, I'm not sure that would work. But maybe we need to ha have these track two conversations with uh, the relevant military partners and say, here are certain things that are permissible and here are certain things that are not, right? And that may sound crazy and, and very idealistic, but at least you're starting to have the conversation, right? Right now there is no conversation. And if I'm the adversary, I'm China or North Korea or Iran, or I don't want to have that conversation with you. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in helping you with, with war termination. So maybe compelling them uh, to have conversations. Maybe arms control is one way to start that conversation. Um, in, if this conflict happened and I had to advise someone, I would say I probably wouldn't respond with nuclear weapons. I might try to keep the conflict conventional. If I had to talk to the Air Force and STRATCOM about fighting conflicts with these different countries, I might say, uh, you understand that what looks like a conventional attack to you could look like a counterforce attack on our adversary. So we need to start thinking about how our war plans might interact with the adversary's war plans. Um, but again, it's, I think my answer is there's, we're all doomed. Right? Because they, they don't want war termination. First question. Thank you. I really enjoyed the talk. Yes. It, it's reminded me of, uh, uh, seems to me, arguments that go back to the 1950s when, yeah. when uh, we had a total retaliation with the Eisenhower administration. Right. And there were some extremely interesting papers in position that Matthew Ridgway took oh, as okay. chief of staff of the Army, okay. in which I think he even predicted the kind of problem was going to be is because that Russia then started nipping away at the corners yes. because all we had was total retaliation. That's and right. Ridgway kind of realized that we better maintain enough of a conventional thing to correspond to that. And the, the other thing that dawned on me is I kind of remember the intelligence after uh, Desert Storm that when the 82nd Airborne went into uh, Saudi Arabia, right. that the, the uh, Rockies did not attack it. It was, it was very extremely vulnerable, and I think there were three Iraqi divisions very close by. But the intelligence was that they believed that the 82nd had uh, nuclear artillery. With, oh, wow. And that an attack would have, uh, would have been net with a, with a nuclear artillery response because if you were about to destroy an American division. So it was that ambiguity and the nebulousness of right. the multi thing, uh, thing, which I think you're also bringing up. Yeah. So, so my, maybe it's a comment more than a yeah. question is that <clears throat> when George Bush Sr. gave up our tactical nuclear right. capabilities, it did extraordinarily limit the type of deterrent posture that we can have, right. which I don't think was a really, really good thing. I don't think it's well thought out. And, That's uh, very it, interesting. And that it, that we complement, that I would just suggest that if we were to complement and nip, you know, if the regional power is taking some liberties and taking, you know, we have to have the ability to nip it real quickly, that it adds it's a huge amplifier to have that nebulous tactical nuclear yeah. capability right. to further confuse the thing and go back to the Huntington kind of thing. That, that's, that's a, um, you've given me a lot of food for thought. When you, when you said the Gulf War, I thought, oh, we're going to talk about scud hunts. Uh, but I don't know that, I know the 82nd Airborne went early, I don't, but I don't know that case. I'd like to talk to you offline about where to, to yeah. dig deeper on that yeah, subject. I was at the Pentagon at the time, and I remember seeing some intelligence. So that, that tells me they were listening to the debates we were having about the RDF, yeah. right? That the rapid deployment force would right. have employ nuclear weapons. And that's also interesting because, you know, one of the takeaways here might be that the Army has a role again with nuclear forces, right? Both, uh, maybe, maybe it's time to bring those things back and to think about them as a deterrent value, right? I'm sure the green suitors in the room are not happy about that. But uh, the second thing it reminds me of too is that if you're in the business of trying to stop different forms of aggression, maybe the Army force size is an issue here, right? So not only the tactical nuclear weapon, maybe you need to have a larger ground force so you can deploy it to different places so you're not victimized by these uh, little tiny nibbles or land grabs. Right. Thanks, that's a great comment. Who's next? Um, Syria. 
<laughs> in four days, uh, the Iran and the Life Plus One, they're going to come to an agreement. Let's assume they sign, you know, Iran will disarm, they will not develop nuclear weapons. Right. John Kerry is going to come out and say he succeeded in deterring Iran. Right. So, the tan what, suit deterred. Yeah, I like it. What, what, what would be the strategy? Well, that's a, uh, that's a little bit off topic, but I'll, I'll venture there since we have time. Uh, my, if, if I were advising uh, the Iranian national security establishment, I would say maybe what we should do here is go right up to some level where we have a latent capability. And uh, that might be good enough for domestic reasons and for national security reasons. And uh, it gets us out of the crosshairs a little bit while still rubbing the belly of the population so they feel good about this whole enterprise, right? And it does buy you a little of insurance because uh, you all would know the technical details better than, than, than I would, but I would assume that at a certain point you have a certain set of knowledge and it's just a matter of trying harder so a latent capability gives you some amount of deterrent. Your question is, how did we compel the, the Iranians to the table? And I think, uh, it's a combination of, of sanctions and uh, kind of an understanding that we probably have uh, interest in the Middle East that overlap and we could probably do things, more things together. And also the recognition that having a latent capability is, is good enough, right? Right now they don't face a huge likelihood of a huge land invasion. That might change over time. I mean, back when we were in both in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? They had the two front war problems. So that would create a huge incentive for nuclear weapons, but it doesn't seem like we have the appetite to do that again. So they can solve lots. There's a nice equilibrium of a latent capability provides us with domestic political advantages and with uh, security advantages. So I'm not sure it's so much that the US compelled, but the Iranians just figured this is, this is, also, this is also good if they do it, if the agreement works. But I, I'm interested in managing proliferation. Not, so. I tell my students at the Bush School, you know, you came here to, to be a counterterrorism specialist, right? Because you saw movies about the CIA with Matt Damon, and that's all very interesting. Uh, some of you came here because you're interested in great power politics. We get like two or three of those out of, the, out of the hundred. There's this middle ground, though, about limited war. What does limited war look like? And in particular, what does limited war look like at sea, right? So if you take the Cold War context, it was a ground conflict, a full invasion of NATO, right, on land. Now we're out in East Asia, we're worried about limited conflicts at sea between nuclear armed powers. What does that look like, right? And I think that another place I would study cases, they're not nuclear cases, but the World War II naval campaigns, right? Because where else can you find examples of conventional naval battles that are relevant to today. Well, you do the Falklands, right? But where else? And it's really thinking about East Asia in that context. Now, World War II will be different, but again, it gives us a baseline for thinking about that. But again, you're right, that Israeli case is, is crucial. So are the cases between the Soviets and the Chinese where they had border skirmishes. There might be others, but in there we could tease out inductively how people are thinking about limited war. What about Israel today being an actor that could go off and change the equation, attacks on, on reactors and things of that sort? Yeah, uh, so you know, the third rail of, of, of uh, international politics is talking about Israel, right? I just, I let my advisor furrow that road. Uh, yeah, I think it's dangerous for the United States to have, uh, to be entrapped by Israeli actions in the Middle East, right? And this is probably one of the reasons why we were so driven to compel Iran to not get a nuclear weapons program, right? Uh, I think the nightmare people worried about is Israel strikes Iran, doesn't do enough damage to retard the program, but does enough damage to irritate everyone and drag us into the conflict, right? So it's the classic allies have two constant fears, abandonment and entrapment. And vis-a-vis -vis Israel, I think we worry about entrapment. Um, and the Israelis have a legitimate security problem, right? Because first of all, 
they're close by Iran. Second of all, Iranian rhetoric is not friendly, right? Twitter notwithstanding. Third, uh, Iran supports a lot of the extremist groups that surround Israel, right? So what, it's not hard to envision Iran becoming like Pakistan with nuclear weapons and ramping up not the conventional conflicts, but the subconventional stuff. <laughs> And here I would refer you to the work of my colleague Paul Kapoor, who's at the Naval Postgraduate School, who's written a great book in the Stanford series about just that, about how Pakistan became more emboldened with its nuclear arsenal, not emboldened to go on huge land grabs, but to sponsor low intensity conflict and insurgency and terrorism. Right? So in the Israel context, we know they have lots of motivation to be afraid of the Iranian bomb. From our perspective, we don't want to get entrapped into a conflict that would be really hard for us to control, right? Uh, you know, how many times are we going to go to the Middle East and, and bomb <laughs> Arab countries or countries in the Middle East, right? It's, it seems like it's becoming a very counterproductive national security policy. Aaron. So uh, you had this nice distribution of uh, different regional power strategies. From, uh, LNO's early or right. you know, last resort right. possible response. And, and then you go to responses, and, and in every case, of course, the right answer is, is don't let the conflict start in the first place. Right. But are you thinking about, or do you have any thoughts about what responses are better suited to someone who's adopted a, you know, an LNO early strategy versus last resort versus possible response? So the, the LNO strategy is probably the easiest to terminate. Because what I envision, so when I say limited nuclear options, there's the limited nuclear options that people thought about in the Cold War as a policymaker, onesies, twosies. And then there are the LNOs that the military would come back with, which were not onesies. It was like onesie, twosies times 100. So my, my vision here is uh, one or two, right? Starting with brandishing, maybe a test, right? Uh, maybe uh, an attack over advancing conventional forces. So in that kind of environment, the strategy for victory of the adversary is demonstrating resolve and the U.S. backs off. So you can imagine a situation where um, North Korea does something bad, a conventional war breaks out on the peninsula, uh, the hot knife of the U.S. ground forces goes through the butter of, of North Korean forces, and they start to use, they detonate one nuclear weapon. Now I would hope that the reaction is a pause on the U.S. side. But the reaction might be, these guys are going nuclear. We have to get them before they, before they start, right? It's the kind of crisis instability question. So maybe to address your war termination issue, because we're talking about war termination here, how should we respond? Maybe we need to start thinking about in our war planning that we demonstrate in kind, and we say, OK, we're going to have a conversation about this. And you have to stop, and we'll stop. But you know. I'm always reminded of Fred E. Clay's book, Every War Must End. It's a small little book, right? I always put it at the end of the class because by the time we get to the end, it's not clear that anyone's reading anymore. <laughs> and for them, it's like every class must end. But in Clay's book, right, he talks about how there are good strategic reasons to end conflicts before everyone starts to suffer these huge costs. But there's one giant constraint, domestic politics. Right? No one wants to be George Ball. No one wants to say, turn it off. Because right? then, then you look weak. Right? You want to be strong. And so even in the case where someone uses one weapon, which I think you can terminate easily, the best response would be maybe a similar demonstration than a conversation. I think for domestic political reasons, people won't want to do that. It will be overwhelmed. But it's more than, it's more than domestic political reasons. It's yeah. precedent for the future. <laughs> Yeah. Right. If you're talking about deterrence, not just now and not right. just in that conflict, right. But going into the future, right. Right. If them setting off one weapon, yep. causes you to stop, yep. Whatever stopping form that takes, right. It shows they have it. achieved some level of their aim. Yes. Right. They may right. not have achieved 100. percent Right. But they've achieved a non-negligible level. So yeah. when the next conflict comes along, right. How does that? You know, what's the, what's the feedback loop? And it's not good, necessarily. It's not. I mean, we're in the realm of bad choices. So, so it's more than just domestic politics. Yeah, it's there's the precedent, precedent argument. If you care about the precedent argument, I, I'm not that concerned with it. I, I'm more concerned with now. 
right? So what's the precedent that worries us? They use a weapon and it demonstrates to everyone that nuclear weapons can stop conflicts. Well, that's, we've already concluded that. <laughs> that's why we have Lawrence Livermore Labs, right? <laughs> That's why, we have national, that's why we have nuclear weapons, because we believe they stop conflict. So the precedent is that an adversary has nuclear weapons, they can stop regime change. Okay, I'm comfortable with that precedent. I understand that will drive incentives for nuclear proliferation, but I have to balance that against this conflict getting out of hand. And so ultimately, I think the precedent argument is used by the same people domestically who don't want to look weak overall, right? The stronger precedent argument is that this is going to unravel all of our commitments. Because we have all these global commitments, right? And if you have the credibility of a president who, you know, is either wearing mom jeans or a tan suit and can't use nuclear weapons in a that doesn't respond effectively to this kind of conflict, right? Then all of our commitments are going to unravel. In the same way when we lost the Vietnam War, NATO collapsed. See, I the precedent argument is a credibility argument, and I'm less worried about it. I understand it's out there, but I'm more concerned about that present conflict, things getting out of hand, especially for things that, uh, you know, this should really focus the mind. Do we care about Taiwan? That we're going to be running these kinds of risks? So um, I have uh, uh, two comments. Uh, one is going back to that 1973 um, war in Israel, uh, my understanding, rightly or wrongly, is that the uh, Soviet Union at one point contemplated, contemplated sending troops to uh, help the Arabs. Right. And uh, in response, the United States uh, put the uh, nuclear bomber force on alert. And the Soviet Union decided, eh, maybe not. So that's also worth looking into. Um, yes, for brandishing purposes. And this is unpacking, right, if I, maybe if I'd taken three hours to give the talk, I would, could have talked about the whole spectrum of limited nuclear options you have. And one of them is putting forces on alert. And by the end of the Cold War, we'd established some routines, dare I say norms, where certain, the alerting of forces was visible to everyone and it was a good way to communicate. So when you talk about what kinds of nuclear weapons we have and what kinds of delivery systems, we should think about that in terms of the kinds of signals we send with them before the conflict starts yeah. and not just right. you know, servicing targets. Right. Um, uh, I like that phrase, servicing targets. Well, <laughs> yeah, Rumsfeld changed it to killing targets, right? Right. But the pre-Rumsfeld phrase was servicing, right. uh, which does have uh, farming connotations as well. Um, <laughs> however, um, the other thing is your rational actor hypothesis. Yeah. Um, it's more of an assumption than a hypothesis. And, and, well, you're a rational actor assumption. So you, so, and you say when you relax that assumption, things get dramatically worse, which yeah. they do, which would imply uh, that it might be worth doing an analysis of the kinds of things we can do to strengthen the unitary rational actor features right. of our adversaries. And Democratize them all. <laughs> well, short of that, something we can do near the term. Right. No, that, that's great. Part of our conflict management is yes. helping those rational actors come to the fore and become more influential in their country. So, you know, that is, that is a very interesting point. The last point is interesting because it reminds me of one of the rationales for security cooperation that OSD used to have. Right? You have mill-to-mill -mill contacts because you want, you want to professionalize their militaries. You want them to understand how we think about these problems. And I think one byproduct is that you try to centralize the decision-making process in those places so you can communicate back and forth more easily. This is a great recommendation. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. So some of the speakers we've had over the last year, there's been a focus on the sorts of capabilities that need to be perhaps maintained or new capabilities developed right. to achieve some of these various policies and strategies that are coming down the pipeline. In, in particular, there's been a focus on ballistic missile defense at a regional right. level right. to take an adversary's cheap shots in terms of trying to execute a successful blackmail strategy off the table. Mm -hmm. What sort of capabilities should we be looking at to assure deterrence of conflict before they start and possibly to terminate, again, uh, support those sort of policy solutions for, for, for the off-ramp? So truth in advertising, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the punishment school. I would be, a, you know, they would take away my PhD if, if I were in any other camp. So my perspective is from the punishment school. And in the punishment school, we see uh, technologies chasing a problem that's never going to catch up 
and solve, right? So I'm not sanguine about, I mean, we can make experiments where like North Korea has two weapons and we know exactly where they are and they're fish in a barrel and we're gonna use one, you know, two uh, conventional arms to take out one weapon, they're gonna get one off and then we're gonna have 10 SM3 track, two BA interceptors, to inter right? So we can, we can create these experiments where the combination of conventional counterforce and missile defenses work but I think that the greater problem is the incentives that our adversaries have to make things get out of control. So I'm not sure the technology is ever going to catch up with this problem because the problem is fundamentally, it, one is enough, I think, to deter us, right? Because we're not, we're not, talking, about high, we're not talking about defending the homeland where we're going to risk, uh, where, where our, our risk acceptance level goes up in terms of our adversaries' nuclear forces. We're talking about one, enduring one, right, for something like Taiwan. Now, there are other views out there, right? The other views are we got to work hard with the kill chain problem, find ways to disarm people, and we got to work hard with missile defenses. I'm not here to tell you you shouldn't have missile defense, right? I like, I like being the unipolar power. I, liked, uh, I like all these different capabilities. I just think we have to not be optimistic about them, right? I guess another argument in the punishment school is that force is a blunt instrument, right? I also think we need to remember the politics here, right? So I'm familiar with a lot of this work, and the political stakes seem not to be in there. Now, one argument would be like, well, you know, kind of in the DOD, OSD level, we don't have to talk about political stakes. That's one answer. But we're, we're also capable of going back to our civilian masters and saying, you know, you may want to think about this problem a little bit harder, right? Because I'm not sure I can provide you with the pristine solution that you want. Got it. You're disturbed by this. Oh, there's a lot of disturbing things here. <laughs> um, on this slide, in your third bullet, you talk yeah. about difficult to control escalation. Mm -hmm. Two slides prior, mm -hmm. in your third or fourth bullet, you yeah. talked about how the U.S. must manage escalation or find ways to manage. I'm not sure I understand the distinction between manage and control. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, It's, it's hard when you pay attention. Uh, so let, let me just be, let's be very clear and try to resolve the contradiction. What I should have said is not manage escalations, find ways to terminate wars. That's different, because managing escalation, war termination is a subset of escalation control. And it's the only subset of escalation control that interests me. I want to find ways to turn it off early, because I'm worried about the longer it goes, the more unintended consequences. So what I mean about managing conflicts is finding ways to quickly turn it off. And I don't know the answer to that. I haven't, I, I'll be honest and say I haven't thought through that. It could be uh, building confidence building measures, right? Maybe we should go out to the Stimson Center and have a conversation with Michael Crapon about setting up red phones. Uh, other people talk about the need for transparency. I think that's a terrible idea for managing conflicts, right? For crisis and stability reasons. This is why I never understand why the Stimson Center talks about the need for transparency in South Asia. I'm like, why? Because you want crisis instability? Right? You don't want people to know where everyone's nuclear forces are. That's, that's not understanding the name of the game. Uh, I think we should have conversations about rules of the road. That, one thing that the Cold War taught us is that after decades of the competition, we established a lot of unwritten rules about things you could do pre-crisis and during a crisis. So maybe we start to have those kinds of conversations. Maybe our think tank types should start writing about war termination and how ways of, so our adversaries can read those reports, right? Because if they're, they're reading about the RDF and, and they believe that the 82nd, the Ready Brigade of the 82nd has nuclear weapons, right? Someone's paying attention to our debates about RDF. So, I mean, I hate to sound like a social constructivist out here, but there is a little bit of people are reading. What we're, all, we're reading their stuff, they're reading our stuff. And in that process, we're conveying information. So I think the war termination stuff is, is hard. The easy solution is, well, the way to terminate the war, right, is conventional counterforce and missile defense. <laughs> I'm just not optimistic that can happen. So the lessons we had from Dr. Strange love on was the red telephone. Right. Our communication. Now Dimitri. Was a right. big, that's right, Dimitri, <laughs> he, he agrees with it. The, the, uh, one of the biggest lessons was communicate, opening up channels of communication was one of the best right. pressure release valves we right. had. And so, so it seems to me that would still be valid with regional power yes. as well. Yes, and you know, we, 
we do this with the Chinese, right? Remember when Brother Gates would go over there and say, you, you need to be a responsible stakeholder, and you also need to be transparent about why you're building these set of capabilities. Well, if you're the Chinese, I'm not sure. Well, they can say, yes, we're, we're all into being responsible. But I'm not sure I want to tell you about all my capabilities, right? Because I'm, I'm David here, and David's not going to communicate to Goliath about how he plans to fight, right? That, that ambiguity of deterrence is, is pretty attractive. Any final questions? They've worn them down. It's like the Battle of the Somme. <laughs> On this idea of escalation, yes. do you feel like uncertain for the... They let druids in the room? Yes, they let druids okay. in the room. Okay. <laughs> so if, if you make it uncertain for the leadership of North Korea or Iran right. when they try and escalate because maybe we have missile defense right. and it doesn't work, does that create a political risk to them that maybe they decide not to escalate because it might not work? And then we'll, we'll there, probably, there probably is a... Thing. There are probably conditions under which where the arsenal is really tiny and we have really good capabilities and we, we put the argument to them that if this ends and you start to escalate, you're going to have, an ac you're going to have a visit to The Hague and then we, you'll have a Milosevic accident and you may not come out alive. I think that's the argument, right? And so that, that might be true. There might be conditions under which they're pretty narrow where we could convince some dictator that you don't want to do this, right? Right, raise the uncertainty of the success. But the counter to that is one is they're in a world of really bad options, and they know when uh, Uncle Sugar comes to the region, right? He likes to do regime change. If he's going to spin up two core or one core, he was he's, he's going to tear down the statue and send you to the spider hole. So he regime change is coming, and two, and two. I think that's also an incentive to build up your arsenal, right? Build that arsenal. The lesson here is five weapons might not be enough. 20, 30, 40, 60, 100, right? Just build them. Keep building, build, 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 right? Because the weaponry systems that can't reach across the ocean might not be enough either. Yeah, yeah. And well, I think, and, and my counter to that is find stuff to target that's nearby. Right? I, I had uh, some RAs one summer. We figured out Patriot battery. How many Patriot batteries and interceptors we would need to cover North Korea and, and, and sorry, cover South Korea, cover Japan? And then how many interceptors? Because we start to think of the target, to, start to expand the target set if you're one of these dictators. Right? Don't worry about targeting Sarah Palin in Alaska. Figure out something nearby, right? target Sarah Palin in Alaska. Yes, it does. Right. Back to your quote about, you know, one over one. DC. Right. And we're back into the Hamilton Jordan problem. Yeah. One over. That's enough to, I'm self deterred at that point. Final question. Aaron. From Brother Miles. <laughs> the thing that I'm kind of hung up on here is that you're, you're you know, positing this, this rational actor, but you're kind of uh, reluctant to accept some kind of continuum in his decision making calculus. Right? You kind of say either if there's, he always knows there's some uncertainty, so therefore he's not going to be constrained. But, uh, and, and furthermore, it doesn't matter so much because if you could just, he'll just drive him to, to build up himself. But if the, the goal is to deter the conflict before they start, it seems like there's got to be this continuum where he's evaluating before he starts aggression, what is, what is the likelihood that this is going to, to be successful? Yeah, I think, I mean, you sort of breeze through these slides, but just to be clear, there is a level of rationality. It's not perfect. It's, it's, there, there are some uncertainties, right? These people are deterrable. But, I, but there is a threshold that you cross where, where the fight starts and you worry that it's becoming less of a limited fight and more of a regime change fight. So maybe this is where we can have a conversation about war termination is what's the threshold, right? There's a threshold where he starts to worry, they're coming after me. Right? So when, when you cross that threshold, you start to behave differently than you did pre-crisis. And I don't, I don't know where that line is. And, and if I'm the adversary, I'm not sure I want to cross, tell you where that line is. Right? One, one obvious line is the border. <laughs> this is what I used to always tell people when I did RAND work. And they're like, what's Pakistan's red lines? How about the border? <laughs> start there. Right? Penn Station would be another. But 
you see the, I, I think that there's a rationale, there's, there's a set, let's, not, let's say there's a set of behaviors and incentives before the crisis, and then once the fight starts, once the fight starts, then the incentives might change because I think you're coming after me, right? And I'm in that, in that realm of bad choices. But we're going to have the same force for both situations. Yes, yeah, right. And, and so the, if you went and looked at that Posen 95 piece I talked about, he's aware that there's this threshold and he thinks it is the border. So he says, I'm going to eject you. I'm going to do everything I can to communicate with my conventional forces that I'm not crossing into Iraq. I'm just ejecting you from Kuwait. Well, you're going to tell the Air Force that, right? Like I said, what's wrong with you, right? Are you a Kenyan socialist? You're, you're going to unshackle me if you want me to defeat Iraq. And so it's hard, right? It's hard. If, if the line is the border and all I want to do is eject you from Kuwait, it's hard to, to say what the threshold is because there are good military reasons to cross those thresholds. Because then the adversary will say, oh, well, you're not going to cross the border. What I'll do is I'll put all my air defense right here up along the border. So I don't know. Well, join me in thanking Jason for a fantastic talk. Thank you very much.